Um, today is uh, day 40 of the 2022 war in Ukraine. I welcome you all to this special hour dedicated to Jewish history and Yiddish culture in Ukraine, even if the current events leave me and many others speechless. My name is Ruth von Bernus, and I'm the director of the Carolina Center for Jewish Studies. Jewish history in Ukraine is complicated, and Ukraine was and is a place of many atrocities, but it was also a place where Yiddish literature once thrived. We will hear more about it from our guests today, who I would like to introduce now in the order they will speak more or less in the next hour. We will have a couple of uh, two presentations and then we actually will talk. Um, so I'm very glad um, that we have Mikhail Krutikov with us today, who will give a short overview about the Jewish history uh, and, and Yiddish literature of Ukraine. Misha is professor of Slavic languages and literatures and of Judaic studies at the University of Michigan. And he's currently working on a study of the Soviet Yiddish author, Denista. Daniel Kahn is the Yiddish singer, songwriter, a poet, and much more. Um, he's based now in Hamburg, as I just heard. And we are glad to have you here with uh, us virtually today. And I hope very much that we will see you sometime at a concert in Chapel Hill in a more peaceful time. Okay. Gnady Estreich was born in a Yiddish speaking family in Zaporizhia in Ukraine. He worked as a managing editor of the Yiddish literary journal, Sovietish Hemland, and he's now a professor at New York University. Michelle Rifkinfish is a professor at UNC's Department of Anthropology. Her research focuses on health and gender in Russia. She just finished a book manuscript on unmaking Russia's abortion culture, family planning, family values, and the search for a liberal biopolitik. And Naomi Seidman teaches at the University of Toronto, where she is the Chancellor Jackman Professor of the Arts in the Department for the Study of Religion and the Center for Di Diaspora and Transnational Studies. She's currently working on a book, The Neville of the Dream, Freud's Jewish languages. And uh, last but not least, Karen Auerbach teaches modern Jewish history, East European Jewish history, and the Holocaust at UNC. She's currently researching the history of Jewish publishers of Polish books in the 19th and early 20th century, in particular their involvement in Polish culture, social and political circles, as well as information networks and the history of Yiddish in Eastern Europe during the Holocaust. Thank you all to the panelists for coming and, and being with us here today. And I would like to give Misha the floor and maybe um, um, everyone can mute you. And put uh, uh, just an announcement to the audience, you can use the chat or you can also use the Q&A for questions. And we hopefully will have some time at the end uh, to answer your questions before we end with the song. Okay, thank you so much, Ruth, and thank you, everybody, for um, having me and for inviting me to this um, very interesting event. So I will uh, share my screen so that we know where we are. And uh, just I have only one uh, image, and this is the map of Ukraine, because I will be talking, looking at this map so that we understand better what we are talking about. And uh, we can, um, I think, position Ukraine differently at the end of the world, but we can also look at Ukraine at the very center of the world, because this is where uh, civilizations of cultures met and fought and could peacefully coexist. And so if you look at Ukraine today, you can see all these neighbors. I'm not going to list them. If you think about 1,000 years ago, 500 years ago, then Ukraine would be open to the um, Muslim, to the Ottoman Empire. This part would be part of the Ottoman Empire. And this would be Catholic Europe. Down here would be Mediterranean. Up there would be the Vikings. At some point, the Mongols came here and they met with the Vikings. So you can't really think of other place, I think, in, in that part of the world that would, would have such a rich and intense 1,000 year um, long history with Jews being present in Ukraine uh, already in the 10th century in Kiev, we have a Hebrew, very interesting Hebrew document uh, about it. Uh, there was also a very um, peculiar Khazar empire located uh, somewhere um, here, actually more like here, uh, which had Judaism as a state religion. So I'm not really going, of course, to 
cover all these thousand years of very rich uh, Jewish history in Ukraine. I'll move into the beginning of the 19th century, which was the beginning of Yiddish literature. And it's a very interesting and open question. Why did Ukraine play such a central role in development of Jewish culture, of modern Jewish culture? Uh, I'll be focusing on Yiddish, but there is also a story of Hebrew. There is a story of uh, uh, Jewish literature in Russian, also Polish writers, of course, Bruno Schultz, I guess the name that is most known. But again, as I said, um, what I will try to do in this very short period of time is to give a very condensed history, some basic um, stages of what happened with Yiddish culture in Ukraine. And again, I don't have a good answer to the question, why was Yiddish so creative, so productive in, in Ukraine, as opposed to other parts of uh, Yiddish speaking world? Of course, we are talking about modern Yiddish literature, not about all Yiddish literature that was centered in Central Europe. Uh, and the story that I want to tell starts somewhere here. I hope you can see the, the cursor. So uh, this is the area that is called Podole, Podilia, uh, that is today Vinnytska, Nadeska, uh, and Khmelnytska um, regions of Ukraine. Uh, this is the cradle of Hasidism. This is where Hasidism was born in uh, Balshem Tov, the founder of Hasidism was born. Uh, he lived and he died in the town of Medjibosh, uh, somewhere in, here in Khmelnytsky. Uh, Misha, region. Misha, yes. Misha, can, uh, people are saying they cannot hear you really clearly. So, um, oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so, what I can try and do maybe change my uh, microphone. No. No. Huh. This got better, Misha, with, with being closer. How is how how about this? Yes, that's better. Yes. And I think okay, slow, 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 slowly, if you speak slowly, I hopefully then everyone can follow. Oh, all right. Okay. Sorry about that. So we are here in the region of Podole or Padilla in the early 19th century, where Hasidism is spreading and uh, so-called masculine, the enlightenment begin to fight against it. And this is actually the beginning point of uh, modern Yiddish literature uh, in, with a very interesting author, Israel Axenfeld, who uh, writes a first novel, uh, The Headband, a very critical novel about uh, Hasidim, but he has to address Hasidim in Yiddish, in the language that they are operating. And also in uh, what would later, what was at the say at that time part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in Galicia, in Ternopil, where uh, another uh, author uh, uh, is uh, um, also fighting uh, against uh, Hasidim, Joseph Perro. Uh, so it's it's the fighting, it's the conflict, it's uh, the uh, competition for. Jewish masses uh, that I think drives Yiddish literature uh, forward. And the next character, the next hero who comes down from here, from around Minsk in Belarus, uh, but he makes his way as a young man to uh, Ukraine, travels through uh, this area of Podole, and then comes to Volynia, to uh, the town of uh, Berdichev, uh, somewhere here. Uh, and this is, uh, his name is Sholom Yankif Abramovich, and he is known as Mendelimoy Hosporim, the grandfather of Yiddish and Hebrew literature. And he creates his Yiddish land, he creates his um, imaginary land that has the capital in that town that he calls Gloops, the full town. And he is very critical uh, in his satire of uh, Jewish oligarchy. He uh, also is very critical of the traditional Jewish lifestyle. Uh, today, I think some people, especially well after the Holocaust, some Yiddish authors really believe that um, he shouldn't really be reading his works because they are too critical of, uh, of that culture that is um, that perished, that he is basically anti-Semitic. But that's what he was, and he created a very interesting uh, imaginary territory with the capital of Gluck that would be something like this. It would stretch over central Ukraine. It will be populated by people like Benjamin III, who is going to uh, discover uh, the imaginary land uh, where 10 tribes of Jews live somewhere in the east. 
Uh, it was a Fischke, Fischke the lame, uh, uh, um, very a, a beggar uh, person with disabilities, uh, really lowest of the law. And he would travel around all the way to Odessa. And Odessa was, of course, the city where Abramovich uh, moved himself. So Odessa is a very important center of Yiddish and Hebrew culture. So Ukraine is uh, being, as it were, appropriated by Yiddish literature, by Yiddish writers, it's populated by literary characters, uh, different parts of Ukraine. So far, we are in the central Ukraine uh, around here. But then the next uh, classic, as they call him, the next classical Yiddish writer comes in, and this is Sholem Aleichem. And Sholem Aleichem comes from a different part of Ukraine. So this part of Ukraine was, uh, for um, centuries, it was part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, apart from the southern part that was under the uh, control of the Ottoman Empire, Turkey. Uh, but this part was the Cossack Ukraine. So this was um, where uh, Bogdan Khmelnytsky, who has, of course, a very bad reputation in Jewish history, that's where he came from, actually, from the area around this uh, city of Zaporizhia, uh, where Gennady uh, was born. And Sholem Aleichem uh, belonged to a very different uh, kind of a uh, very different Jewish community in Ukraine because they did not have the deep roots in uh, medieval Polish history. They were recent, as it were, newcomers in the 19th century. And uh, for Sholem Aleichem, it was Kiev that became his uh, capital, the city that he gave his name of Yehutas, another imaginary name. It's really interesting how Jewish imagination work through this Ukrainian landscape, how they created their own territory, their own land, but yet Jews were very deeply, deeply rooted in that land. And, um, and then, of course, Kiev becomes the center of Yiddish and Jewish modernism in the early 20th century. And this is a very dramatic, very tragic moment when, uh, um, uh, right after the first, even during the First World War, uh, in around uh, after the first after the Russian Revolution in 1917, uh, Ukraine declares independence, and uh, there is the first Ukrainian uh, so-called Ukrainian People's Republic, the first uh, Ukrainian state that uh, proclaims uh, the right for national cultural national autonomy, something that was absolutely unique, and Ukraine was actually the first state to officially recognize minorities with their Right. Uh, later in the 1918, I think that became part of the peace settlement and the condition on which other Central European states were recognized. But Ukraine wasn't really forced into it. Of course, there were political reasons for doing this, which gave a great boost to um, Yiddish culture and arts and uh, the um, so organization, so called Kultur Liga, uh, cult, uh, Cultural League, League of Culture. Uh, became a sort of Ministry of Culture in that Ukrainian People's Republic. And there is a tragic paradox in a way, in a sense that the Ukrainian People's Republic was, I guess, what we would call today fail, a failed state. It wasn't really able to control its border. It wasn't able to control its military. So we, of course, all know about uh, terrible uh, pogroms, especially of 1919, that were uh, conducted by by Ukrainian military, also by the Russian whites, by the Reds, by all kinds of uh, um, guerrilla uh, units. And yet, at the same time, there was an amazing flourishing of Yiddish culture and art. So artists, well-known artists like uh, Elisitsky and uh, Mark Chagall uh, worked there. Oops. Uh, I didn't want to end this. Um, Okay, I think I'll stop sharing that. And um, this is how Kiev for uh, about uh, five years became, becomes the center of Yiddish uh, and Jewish modernism in, uh, in the world. So uh, the Soviet period, of course, brings new changes and new developments. And again, Kiev is one of the major centers of Yiddish, of Soviet Yiddish culture. Uh, with the uh, very interesting work being done in the folklore studies, in the study of literature. Um, so uh, the song that we will hear was recorded by uh, Moisey Beregovsky, Moisey Beregovsky, who was uh, a researcher of Yiddish uh, folklore. 
in Kiev, so it was done within the framework of Soviet Yiddish academic institutions. Unfortunately, uh, those institutions were uh, were um, um, kind of winding down uh, due to Stalinist um, suppression in the late uh, 30s, and then the Holocaust, uh, the Holocaust, uh, I mean, I don't need to talk uh, much about it, but even after the Holocaust, Kiev was still uh, an interesting place for study of Jewish folklore, of Yiddish uh, folklore. And perhaps the um, most recent work uh, that I can mention that all deals specifically with Ukrainian landscape, with Ukrainian Jews, are a series of uh, reportages by the Soviet Yiddish writer Shmuel Gardon, who traveled uh, around the Shtetlach in uh, Podole going back to that where Yiddish literature began. And uh, he uh, described what he found there. And it's very interesting to see how much of Yiddish culture, how much of Jewish activity was still preserved uh, back then. And of course, now, uh, again, as we will hear today, uh, there is an interest, there is a revival of Jewish culture, the Ukrainian Jews. Ukraine is actually one of a um, few European countries where the Jewish community is quite alive, and this is sort of indigenous Jewish community, and we know that Jews play a very significant role in uh, Ukrainian business and politics. Okay, so people can argue about whether it's positive or not, but I think that's, uh, that's it's not the end of this story. That's what I was, uh, what I'm trying to say. It's a story that has a beginning. It's a very active story. It's a dramatic story. It has its tragic moments, uh, but it's a very rich story that continues. Thank you. A großen Dank and Daniel. Yeah, thank you, Misha. It, <clears throat> wow, this is a it's it's a real honor, a COVID for me to be here with such Galanta uh, Cap, which such which such amazing uh, minds and people, and and uh, thank you for having me. Um, I. Uh, I, I want to make sure everyone can understand me. Uh, is is the microphone loud enough? Is it close enough? Le let me know. Uh, let me know. I, I I'm going to be playing the piano a little bit here. Um, let me let me switch this up a little bit here for a second. Uh, there. Can you see me now? All right. So. <clears throat> I'll sing a little bit of a song, a very old song, and uh, I'll read a, a text that I wrote about this song. Um, I guess it was uh, eight years ago, around the time of the uh, annexation of Crimea, in the middle of the... Uh, well, I don't, the beginning of what we now, what has now turned into a major conflagration. Um, the title of this article is The Year 14 Has Arrived. The darkest of years left us this darkest of songs. A century later, the Tsar's bloody borderlands are singing again. So I guess this was also written on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the First World War. And uh, that's where this song comes from. It's a, it's a Jewish soldier's song from Ukraine. Das 14. Jahr ist angekommen, wei, wei, wei. Das 14. Jahr ist angekommen, Far a soldat hot men mecht sig nemen, wei hoi wei. Far a soldat hot men mecht sig nemen, wei hoi 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 wei. Jeg ben af en slacht for der uf gekemen, wei hoi wei. Jeg ben af en slacht for der uf gekemen, da bin getroffen mein tavarisch in blit schwimmen, wei hoi wei.
the year 14 arrived. They took me as a soldier. Of the green felder welder, of the huge bee. Of the green felder welder, dort liegt a gehargeter Zelder, of the huge bee. Dort liegt a gehargeter Zelder, of the On the green fields and in the forests, there lies a slaughtered soldier. It's a bleak ballad, a call from the grave. The form of each verse is the same, a true blues, a true dirge. The first line, a wail, a moan, an oy vey then repeated, joined by the second line, oy vey, and then the second line repeated, oy vey, all the way to the funeral, attended only by a faithful horse, nor dus ferdus getraje vey, oy vey, nor dus ferdus getraje, vet bashain in die ganze levaje vey, oy vey, a real folk song, it is both witness and testament to its own story. Collected by Soviet ethnomusicologist Moshe Beregovsky, about whom we just heard from Misha, in Ukraine in 1930, it was recorded onto a wax cylinder by a Jewish worker in the city of Uman. I first learned this song from Yiddishist Michael Alpert in 2006 at the height of our own country's criminal folly in Iraq. And the song hit me hard. Now, in the new year 14, the old borderlands of the Tsar are in turmoil again. Soaked in blood and tears, mud and black soot, this song is a song devoid of honor, glory, pride, nation, meaning, cause. The melody is from an old Ukrainian soldier's march. Sometimes the oy vey gets drawn out into a ta -da 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 -da. This is the only trace left of a drum marching away in retreat as the singer is left with his ruined body on the field. Sung by Jewish soldiers, widows, mothers, sons through two world wars, fighting and dying for a motherland who never loved them, against a fatherland who only proved to love them even less. Over 650,000 Jews fought for Tsar Nikolai II in the Great War. 100,000 of those ended up in songs like this one. A traditional folk epic. Some variants have more than 20 verses. In every version, there's always a field, always a forest, always blood, always a wail. Ich bin auf den Schlag für der Ruf gekommen in der Wei, Wei, Wei. Ich bin auf den Schlag für der Ruf gekommen, ob ich getroffen, mein Tavar ist in Blitz schwimmen in der Wei, Wei, Wei. In sein Körper ist zerrissen in der Wei, Wei, Wei. In sein Körper ist zerrissen, in sein Eiver, tit Blitz fließen in der Wei, Wei, Wei. And there's always a bird coming to rest. Sometimes on his grave, usually on his body. Na der meine Hände liegen mit deinen Augen. Oh, you 
blackbird, take my hands, give me your eyes. When Fliegeschwind, fly to my mother, tell her I'm well. Zug mein Mama, als ich bin gesinnt, nor find mein Teut, sollst du ihr nicht zugen. Do not tell her of my death. She still remembers the old czars, the old days of the Kantonists, poor Jewish boys drafted for 32 years to serve in the first Nikolai's ranks, who were the first into the pit, the first into the abyss, the last to come home. For millions of people, after the Great War, there was no home to come home to. Unlike so many patriotic marches and anthems of the time, Yiddish songs like this show us vividly from the start the true face of war. It is a catastrophe, an absurdity, an obscenity, too bestial even to be tragic. It is the business of all businesses, devouring its own labor force, demanding blood for a czar, a god, a tribe, a flag, a language, an economy, filling the woods and fields with the ghosts of the disappeared. As once more the borders of Ukraine are redrawn by old passions and hatreds, Russian czars, secret police, torture, black hundreds, martyrs for freedom, the song brings us back to the wasted son, the forlorn mother who intones, Die Sand ist schön und drin in der Weh, oi Weh. Die Sand ist schön und drin in, in mein Kind, wer daheim nicht käme, oi Weh. In mein Kind, wer daheim nicht käme, oi Weh, oi Weh, oi Weh. The sand has already run out, and my child will never return home. But reading this on a page isn't quite the same as singing it or hearing it, or living it. Wer wird noch mir Kaddish zugen? Wey, oi, wey. Wer wird noch mir Kaddish zugen? Wer wird weinen, wer wird kluden? Wey, oi, wey. Wer wird weinen, wer wird kluden? Wey, oi, wey. So um, that's uh, that's an old song that just doesn't get old. Um, I hope everyone was able to hear and see. Um, yeah, it, it can be found in this amazing book, uh, Old Jewish Folk Music, the collections and the writings of Moshe Berigovsky, edited by Mark Slobin. Um, yeah, I uh, I don't know what to say here. I, 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 are, 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 we, are we moving on now, or are there any questions, or, or what? Uh... <laughs> it's always Daniel, nice. it, is, it, is, it is, I mean, this song is, uh, makes, uh, yeah, it's uh, hard to. <laughs> um... I, I'm sorry I didn't have something a little more uplifting, but, uh, the, the, you know, that would be inappropriate. This fits the time. This fits um, the time. Yeah, the, these old songs have a way of, they have a, a kind of cyclical relevance, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's striking. How, you know, I, I love going to these old things and, and, you know, finding the ways in which they just... I mean, there's even some geography in this. Actually, it says "Mirzenin in the in the Karpatan Gigangan," you know. So it's really it really is a First World War song describing you know Jewish soldiers marching into the Carpathian Mountains. Uh, but um, it's uh, yeah, we we talk about history, and it, it doesn't really. Uh, History doesn't really go anywhere, does it? Uh, uh, and 
I, I'm, I wonder about, uh, you know, th there have been a lot of articles coming out about the, the subtleties of, um, let's say the, the complexities of Jewish cultural identity and historical consciousness, particularly when it comes to Ukraine and questions of nationalism and questions of belonging, et cetera. And I, I think that, um, uh, we songs like this remind me they they like to I, I appreciate songs like this because they remind me of at the same time that things are very complex things are also extremely simple and i think that we can all get lost in the the discourse of complexity and nuance and and i think that it's it's important to remember like it, especially in moments like this in in what sharp relief the simplicity of this situation comes which is that uh, basically it, we're, we're dealing with a very old very simple problem which is murderous imperialism um and uh that's that's something which kind of um washes away subtlety uh when when you look at the human level of it um uh, so that, that, I don't know. I, I'm preempting questions, I guess. I don't know. Are, are there questions or should, should we, should we move on? We can, I, 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 I yeah. Now let's, let's, why don't we hear a little bit from Gennady, uh, who's the yes, Ukrainian. I, 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 okay. I, that's the thing. Like I'm, I'm, I'm so like geeked to be in this company right now so like to to have heard from misha krutikov and and to be in in the presence of gennady estreich i mean uh gennady you are um a, a scholar and a luminary and you you carry this the this well what i just said was this complexity but you know in all of its complexity you you are you carry that and and you come from the lands that we're talking about and i would yeah pass it on to you i would love to to hear from you now Daniel, it was excellent. It was just oh, excellent. It's and it's very difficult to, to switch to something else. And uh, really, uh, Ukraine, I, I was really born in U Ukraine and I grew up in, in U Ukraine. I left Ukraine when I was 23, I believe, yes. So I, I know the language. I can't say that I'm a fluent Ukrainian speaker, but I certainly have fluent uh, uh, Ukrainian. Uh, what is it? Uh, I, I understand it, it, it uh, yeah, as, as my language, absolutely. Especially now, when I listen you know, the entire time, the, the news. Yeah. But um, what I want to uh, to say that it is surprising that uh, we still don't have a book about uh, Jewish life in uh, Ukraine. I mean, I mean specifically uh, during the Soviet period. Yes, we have a few books about uh, Belarus, or <coughs> on, on our people call it mainly. Belarusia, but uh, <clears throat> Ukraine is not. We, we have case studies, we, we have articles, we have various, but we don't have it. And in general, <clears throat> I believe this reflects uh, the general uh, st uh, the state of affairs. Uh, until uh, the 1990s, uh, Soviet Jewish history would be written outside the Soviet Union, because in the Soviet Union it was impossible, there was no place, there was no a uh, chance to deal with, uh, with uh, Jewish history. And outside, the uh, special attention uh, was uh, um, what? Emigration. It was an emigration. The idea that the Jews yeah, were in, 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 in a difficult situation and, and they were sitting on their suitcases here yeah, and waiting for a chance to move. Yeah, and, and even after the 1990s, we see. In, in reality, the majority of Jews, of course, in Ukraine were just living here, just uh, being born, uh, getting education, yeah, finding jobs, getting married, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, until the 1990s, the same 1990s, the bulk of uh, uh, Jews in, in Ukraine continued to live in, in Ukraine. And we still, I repeat once again, we don't have uh, not only something comprehensive, we just, don't have an overview of uh, Soviet uh, Jewish life in, in in general in the Soviet Union and in Ukraine specifically, and especially as there was the general we can say the Soviet Jewish life, but uh, there were some peculiarities of Soviet Jewish life in Belarus, Soviet Jewish life in Ukraine. It's it's quite 
different stories. <clears throat> I want to mention just one story. But my family comes from a Jewish agricultural colony. And at the moment, the Jewish agricultural colony is occupied by the Russian army, Nayislatov. And uh, Ukraine was in general, in general the place where this whole experiment of uh, making uh, Jewish uh, peasantry started in the 19th century. Actually, we can find the beginning in, in some decree issued in 1804 and so on and so forth. Uh, so my family on my mother's side, they came to the Jewish colony. All of them were Litvaks. Actually, the Jewish colonists in Ukraine were Litvaks, but, but, but this uh, uh, settled in, uh, in Ukraine. This is the story, and I want to make it short, yes. So the story was that uh, the, uh, the uh, Tsarist government was interested and even obsessed with an idea, with numerous ideas concerning Jews, and one of the ideas was of making them productive productive, you know, to make uh, yeah, some kind of productive at that time was to, to be farmers. So as, as, a, as a result, by the end of the Zarist period, there were about 70,000 Jewish farmers, in, mainly in Ukraine, in, in various colonies. Sometimes they lived together with, uh, with, with, the, with the German colonies. For example, where my family from this nice latter it was a Jewish German colony. It was Jewish, but there was also a short street of uh, German colonies who, uh, the idea was that the German colonists actually knew how to do it. That there was, uh, the, the, the idea was that they uh, had to play the role of instructors. And actually they continued to live this one long Jewish street and one sh short uh, German street for a century, until 1941. In 1941, of course, uh, radically changed the whole story. But there were even, during the Soviet period, uh, mixed uh, families. In one of the Yiddish schools in, in Naislatopo, one of the teachers of Yiddish language and literature was German, actually, because German Yiddish was the lingua franca. Uh, Jews could understand their German. It was a, a kind of a plot to touch that, that they couldn't understand. And the Germans spoke exactly the same Yiddish as, um, the, as the, the Jews. My, my brother, who was almost 20 years older than I was, his nanny was German, but uh, until five, uh, uh, at the age of five years, they spoke Yiddish only because this German nanny spoke also Yiddish. Uh, during the Soviet period, there was another story. There was uh, once again the development of and further development, and a very significant development of Jewish colonies, not only in, in Ukraine, but once again mainly in, in Ukraine. Uh, in 1926, I believe, in Philadelphia, there was a conference. Over 1,000 delegates came of various Jewish organizations, the joint, not the, the joint, and so on. And after a few days of uh, discussing everything, the, how to invest the money, the millions raised in, in the United States, the decision was 50-50, 50% to Palestine and 50% mainly to colonization in the Soviet uh, Union, yes. And so to a significant de degree it was done thanks to the allocation of uh, the place by the Soviet government. But the money, the uh, equipment, uh, tractors, uh, harvesters, uh, agriculturalists, they came to a significant degree from, from the United States. In Ukraine, there were three Jewish autonomous districts, plus two autonomous districts, uh, Jewish autonomous di districts were in uh, Crimea. So, so in Ukraine, it was Stalindorf, Kaliningrad, and Naislatopol, these three districts, and in, Ukraine, in uh, Crimea, Larendorf and uh, Freidorf, yes. So it was many Jewish uh, states. Yiddish was the dominant language. In, in some of such, uh, of course, the, they also had Yiddish schools. They also had, uh, everything was in Yiddish. The collective farms was in Yiddish. My father graduated <coughs> from, uh, uh, it was in, in another place in Ukraine, in Zhitomer. There was a pedagogical institute and he was trained as a teacher uh, in Yiddish of history, and he was dispatched to this colony. 
And my mother uh, was his student at an agricultural college, so also in Yiddish. So everything was in Yiddish. And actually, my mother never learned properly Russian. Her Russian was impressionist somehow. She, she would do a, an ad hoc grammar each time somehow created. Yeah. So this was uh, the story that is uh, once again is waiting for someone to describe. There are, there are separate uh, st uh, sub stories, there, there are case stories, but the entire story, there is a book uh, by the Israeli historian, uh, Jonathan Dekelhen about the Crimean uh, colonies, but then uh, we still don't have a, a similar book about the uh, colonies in, in Ukraine. I hope that one day one of our doctoral students at the NYU will produce such a uh, research, at least I, I hope. And I, I am trying to push into this direction. So uh, this is what disappeared really after, after the Second World War, but the colonists continued to live in various places. And my impression that they were the, maybe not the only, but maybe in some places the main carriers of Yiddish, because until 1941, Yiddish was the, 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 the language, and for many people, the only language. For example, for my grandparents, uh, I, I grew up with, with them. It was the uh, only language. I'm not sure even if my grandmother knew uh, Russian or Ukrainian. I never heard her speaking it. My grandfather certainly knew Russian, though. I, once again, I never heard him speaking it, but I know that he knew because he served in the Russian army, yes, but he survived, yes, uh, from, he, he didn't participate in the First World War, but in, uh, in, in some other military campaigns he participated. So what I, I want to say, I understand that we, we don't have too much time, yeah? and uh, uh, I, I want to say that uh, when I look and I, when I listen, for what is going on nowadays in Ukraine, I have before my eyes my map. I map I, I, because I remember Zaporozhye, and now the front line is just uh, 30 or 40 miles from Zaporozhye. And I already told that this uh, Jewish area that used to be Jewish areas is now uh, occupied, and Gule Pole once, once again comes up here that it was very Jewish and during the civil war, it played an important role. And the only hope now that it will be over, one day that it will be all now, over, this is the, the only hope. Yeah, thank you. Um, th thank you, Gennady, for, for coming and for sharing these uh, stories with us. I know that Michelle um, had Many questions, but maybe you go ahead. Well, I just want to thank you all for being here and such a wonderful opportunity um, for all of us here in Chapel Hill to learn and be connected um, in so many ways to the importance of Ukraine and Jewish and Yiddish culture. I wanted to ask a little bit about the history of this Yiddish cultural revival um, Gennady, you've talked about, and Misha have talked about what happened in some ways prior to World War II, and then we have this big Soviet era, and then now we have, an, uh, Daniel, you as an American-born Jewish person coming over to Berlin and being part of a Yiddish revival of these amazing poems and songs, and I wonder if you all could kind of fill in for us the history of when was the Yiddish cultural revival possible? When did it become possible? Was it during Glasnost? Was it during, after the Soviet Union collapsed? Was it even before? And how has it been developing over the last year since, since you've been involved, Daniel, and, and leading it in, in many ways? I think I can say a few words before I leave. Uh, first of all, I think we should, uh, appreciate that Yiddish has been always spoken. So after the Holocaust, there were whole spe Yiddish speaking communities that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Gordon described them. Uh, I still could, you know, you could still, 10 years ago, you could still go to Podolia, which was part of Romania, you could buy Transnistria with the more Jews who survived. And you could hear people speak Yiddish and you could hear people, very simple people, they were like a barber at a bus station who would speak two languages easily. 
so it never actually disappeared completely. I mean, people were not literate, they couldn't read, and they, uh, but they, they, they're quite conversant in the language. So this is one thing that we have to keep in mind. And that was especially the case in the south of Ukraine, uh, in Padolia and in, in the Sarab. I think today in the Sarab, in Moldova, you can still find people 50 years old who speak Yiddish. So that's, that's one thing. But now I think I have to leave and let, <laughs> let Daniel and United continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With this, uh, with a revival in in 1990, I was still uh, on uh, uh, Sovietus Hameland. We had uh, we traveled. There was, there was such a, a tradition to meet uh, uh, with the readers. Yes, and we went to Berdichev. We went to a few places, Zhitomir, and uh, 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 a few other places in Ukraine. And you know, uh, uh, in 1990. There were still, and everything was in Yiddish. There were still very significant crowds of people who would come to such events. The same Berdichev, uh, I, I remember Zetomir, the same Novgorod Wawalins, Kolostein. Yeah, there were still many people, but they were elderly people. As a rule, uh, they were products of uh, Soviet Yiddish schools. And of course, they were still fluent in Yiddish. Many of them were readers of, of Sovietus Heimland. Uh, the, the same uh, in, in other places of the Soviet Union. But afterwards, uh, the immigration came. And the immigration came and actually they started moving out, moving out, moving out. And finally, of course, if we speak about Yiddish, uh, the decline of uh, uh, Yiddish, spoken Yiddish, was uh, very significant. Simply Yiddish speakers uh, were m moving out, or unfortunately, they were also elderly people, yes. Uh, after, uh, around that time, in 1990, there were still a few uh, professional Yiddish writers living in uh, uh, Kiev, in uh, Chernivtsi, uh, where else, uh, in, in Odessa. There were still a few, uh, 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 once again, elderly, elderly people, and uh, they continued to, to write, and their books continued to be published. There were even conversations, once again, in 1990, and I left in 1991, and it, this was more or less the end of uh, Soviet Union, not because I left, but it simply coincided. Uh, but uh, there were conversations about even launching a Yiddish uh, literary journal in, in the Ukraine or uh, some periodical, maybe not a monthly, certainly not a monthly, but some periodical. And actually it was uh, uh, supported by Ukrainian writers. There is also uh, this uh, uh, topic, this uh, theme of this Ukrainian uh, Jewish cultural cooperation of artists, writers, and, and so on during the entire Soviet period. And it continued actually uh, till the end of the Soviet period that I could uh, witness. But a revival, a revival afterwards, and I'm, to be honest, I'm a bit uh, skeptical about revival because the moment I came to England in 1991 and even earlier when I visited the various countries, the United States and so on, I started, uh, uh, getting this revival, revival, revival. And it's still 30 years later, it is a revival of it. Yeah, we're, we're still in, in a revival, but I am waiting for this revival. Yeah, it is a kind of a present continuous or, or, or something else. Yeah, it is still, as, uh, from that time on, I believe there's always a critical mass. There's a stable number, more or less a stable number of people really devoted to Yiddish, dealing with this in various fields in the music, in, in literature, and so on. So this is, if we can call this revival, then it is uh, fine. Then it's fine by me, it's a revival. <laughs> Why not? You know, as we're saying, it is Gizunta yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, do you want to add to this? Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, sure. I mean, I think that, but w what G Gennady is, is talking about is, is precisely why I think revival is 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 the wrong framework to talk about this culture, um, because you're talking about very strong 
um, connections of, of continuity. And yeah, like, if you can focus on the loss, but I mean, I know, and I had the, the, the privilege of, of learning from teachers who, and, and working with, 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 with people who, who, yeah, I mean, they, they didn't go anywhere. I mean, the, you know, revival implies death. It implies that something needs to be resurrected. And the truth is that there are very, very important, uh, lines of, of connection and continuity that through all of the vagaries of history of war and emigration and assimilation and various political and cultural catastrophes, the, you know, there was a great resilience and, and it wasn't an accident. I mean, it was people who were, you know, as, as, as Gennady said, you know, committed to, to, to the culture, to literature, to, to, um, the music. And, you know, let's not forget, like there are, I think by some estimates, over a million native Yiddish speakers in the world today, um, most of whom are in, you know, uh, Hasidic communities or, you know, Haredi communities. But I mean, there's a strong international movement for Yiddish arts and culture um, and academics and, you know, dance and music and literature. And, and uh, that is... Um, for those of us who who are who move in those circles it's this this idea of revival really has nothing to do with the kind of work that people do it's not something that people think about uh it's more of an it's a conversation and it's a conversation that has as much to do with the world today as it does with the world 100 years ago um you know and the fact that you know the so much of this cultural work is done in diaspora spaces uh, in so much of the work that has to do with also the former Soviet cultures are also in, in a diaspora, you know, and we find ourselves playing klezmer concerts at the, uh, you know, Ukrainian national home on, the, uh, you know, in, in the East Village. And there are all kinds of, you know, collaborative projects that happen in Berlin and Tel Aviv and, uh, California and Montreal, uh, where folks have a chance to work together in ways that they might not have been able to in, you know, in Soviet Ukraine or in divided Berlin or, you know, in New York of the 1970s when the so-called Klezmer revival happened. Um, and I think that this this has given us amazing opportunities for collaboration. And uh, you know, my the 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 teacher who told me to go and learn Yiddish was Arkady Gendler, Oliver Sholem, who, you know, spent his life living in you know, he, he was he was originally from Soroka or he was born in Belts and then he lived in Soroka and then he was in the Red Army and then he and he was a chemist and he lived his entire life as a Yiddish teacher and a Yiddish singer and a Yiddish songwriter and a song rescuer. And he lived in, in Zaporizhia and he died a few years ago. And, um, he is as much as he is sorely missed. I'm not the only one who knew him well and who loved him dearly, who has uh, also said that, um, in some ways it's a blessing that he doesn't have to see what's happening to his city right now, to his country. Um, but, you know, there was no revival when it came to Arkadi, you know, he, he continued to speak and sing Yiddish throughout the, the history of the Soviet Union. He, uh, led the first, uh, Shabbos gathering in Zaporizhia after the collapse of the Soviet Union, where he, he got a personal dispensation from a rabbi in Israel to be allowed to use an electric microphone when he was leading Shabbos so that all of the hundreds of people who came to that first Friday night public Shabbos in Zaporizhia after the Soviet Union collapsed so that they could all hear him because he was the only one who knew the prayers. And so this was a this is not a story of revival. This is about continuity. I, 
I know that we are, um, the time is uh, running faster than I wish it, it would. Um, I, I want, wanted to give Karen and Naomi very, just um, the floor to say a couple of words. And then um, uh, Daniel, if you could finish uh, with the song and I think a, 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 with a little bit of hope, hopefully. Okay. Yeah. First, thank you, Gennady and Misha and his essence um, for, for your words and especially to Daniel for your uh, powerful music and words. Um, it's, it's nice to be part of this panel despite the, the topic. Um, in, in addition to being uh, horrified over the last more than a month, month and a half almost now um, by the, the horrors in Ukraine, I've really been struck by the fact that a, a Jewish man has become the face of the Ukrainian state nation um, to the world. And I've really been sort of thinking about what this tells us about contemporary Ukraine. And I think it's the very opposite of what Putin has, you know, propagandized, which is, you know, it's, it's the prevailing of an inclusive nationalism um, and the marginality of exclusionary nationalism. And I suppose I'm really asking, you know, um, Ben Avi, your thoughts about this. But it also seems to me like, it, you know, that the interest rather than revival, but the, the interest in Yiddish culture in Poland and Germany is also part of this sort of assertion of an inclusionary um, national sense of national belonging. Um, and I, if, if I'm sort of right about this, I wonder what, uh, what your thoughts are, Gennady, um, Daniel, about, um, about why. And I, I suppose Gennady in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the context of Ukrainian history, is it the influence of Soviet education? Is it the sort of the, the line from, um, you know, the Ukrainian pledge of Jewish autonomy more than 100 years ago. Um, I can't imagine a Jewish man being the face of the Polish nation um, in, as a president in Poland, for example. So uh, that's, that's, those have been my thoughts, and I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts, Gennady and, and Daniel as well. Yeah, and I, I, I think, I, I think what, what, what we've done in this hour, this shows that we need to continue this and we actually need to continue this, not just for an hour. We need more, more than one hour. So I would say, this is the questions we carry on. And Naomi, um, maybe you have uh, something else and then I will give um, Daniel the... I'll save my question for our next gathering, but thank you so much. This has been so rich and moving and informative. So thank you. And I, Daniel, I would uh, like you, give you really the music, the last word, because I think that's what we all need now. Well, thank you all. And and um, yeah, and that, that's an excellent question, Karen, and I'm not in a position to answer it. And uh, I, I, who knows? Who knows? I mean, you know, Zola Lebanon gesund sein, and you know maybe maybe uh, Zelensky could answer that question someday. Um, I was going to sing a totally different song, but I just changed my mind. I'm going to sing a song um, th that has a little bit of hope, I guess. I don't know. It's a, a song which uh, <clears throat> it used to be a Shabbos song. It used to be a folk song. And I, I found recently a variant of it that actually is about Golis, about diaspora, about exile. But I know this as a song by um, the great Adrian Cooper. Um, Adrian Cooper was uh, an embodiment of continuity. She was uh, an amazing singer, teacher, mother, friend, um, powerful, powerful, wonderful mensch. And um, she took this Hasidic Shabbos song and she changed just a couple of letters in it and she completely transformed it into uh, a song that the whole world needs. And her daughter, Sarah Gordon, my good friend, translated it into English. And it goes like this. <laughs> Wo 
Voltech gehad koyech, Voltech gelaufen in die Gassen, Voltech geschrieben Scholem, Oi Scholem, Scholem, Scholem. If my voice were louder, if my body's stronger, I would tear through the streets, crying peace, peace, peace. Yada da 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 da, yada da 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 da, yada da 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 da, yada da 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 da, da 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 da, yada da 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 da, yada da 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 da, yada da 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 da, da 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 da, da I just remembered Theodore Bekel, Oliver Sholem, he also translated it once. He shared it with me. It went like this. If I had strength and vigor, I'd find the words and call them. In a voice grown big and bigger, I call out, Sholem, Sholem, Oi, Wodech gehad koyech, Wodech gelaufen in die Gassen, Wodech geschrieben, Sholem, Oi, Sholem, 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 Seid gesund und stark. Alle. Seid gesund und stark. And thank you for everyone who came here tonight.